गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन वी वेलकम यू ऑल टू ऑर्थो टीवी ऑनलाइन दिस इज अल वेबिनार इज ब्रॉड टू यू इन एसोसिएशन विद पीक पीक मेड कंपनी फ्रॉम पोर्चुगल टूडे वी हैव विथ अस डॉक्टर लेवी राइना फर्नांडिस ऑल द वे फ्रॉम पोर्चुगल ही इज गोइंग टू बी हिज मेन स्पेशलिटी इज डिफॉर्मिटी करेक्शन एंड ही इज गोइंग टू बी टॉकिंग टू अस ऑन how he uses the peakmed software by in demons and he is going to demonstrate us on doing automatic osteotomy around the knee on the panelist we also have with us dr mangal parihar and dr webo bagaria from mumbai india so over to dr levi rina fernandes okay thank you so much for the introduction um i'm a dedicated knee surgeon with a special interest in osteotomy around the knee and together with big math we develop a, an automatic osteotomy tool then that brought us here today so just a little bit uh, topic from big math it's a medtech company based from in portugal founded in 2015 with a multidisciplinary team and team and it's been used by more than 2000 orthopedic surgeons so this is a, a, a program that does uh, allows you to do tra some trauma surgery planning osteotomy around the knee which are we will explore uh, later on templating for tkr and thr and as cloud integration and bags integration so it has a lot of automated procedures already measurements of angles and the tool that i'm going to explain now is the automatic osteotomy around the knee so this is a very important uh, follow up to this fantastic webinar with my dear friend and mentor professor dr christian clay that together with professor adrian wilson gave um, very good webinar about osteotomy around the knee and how to get it right and all the principles that I've spoken of is are already incorporated in this tool so i want to start with a basic but important concept that not all the varus are on the tibia and not all the valgus are on the femur there's um, an osteotomy in the united kingdom knee osteotomy registry shows shows us that uh, around the 500 hcos that are registered 80% are for varus and 20% are for valgus of the dfos 80% are for varus and 92% are for valgus there's no true epidemiological study on the deformities so in my personal experience when i was in hanover in germany a few years ago i witnessed around 30 osteotomies around the knee in two months and we i saw that uh, most of them are for varus are on the tibia but there are some uh, also on the femur and double level osteotomies and for valgus you can see that was an even uh, distribution so yeah, i went back to my hospital and did the same study 53 patients that i managed to collect the data and you can see on the on the table that the tibia varus tibia was only 50% 55% on the femur were 15% and there were double level osteotomies in 30% of the cases so you see that it's really important to plan and do the proper deformity analysis so what are the problems with planning uh, sometimes there's no deformity analysis or no planning sometimes you do plan but you just don't do it right but most of the times what i think most people experience is just difficulty in planning so especially if you are playing manually especially if you are facing uh, uh double level osteotomies or uh, joint line congruency angles way out of the normal so the solution was an automatic osteotomy planning tool that allows the correction on the frontal plane uh, both single and double level osteotomy that takes into account the joint line congruency angle that it's easy it's fast and as our full technical support so the steps first you start with the deformity analysis then you choose to take into account the, the joint line congruency angle then you select the degree of correction then you mark the cut and then you do the automatic cut and measurements so for the deformity analysis we look at the mechanical tibial femoral angle that it will show us if it's a varus or a valgus to the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle to show us if the deformity is on the femur to the mechanical medial proximal tibial angle to show us if the deformity is on the tibia and to the joint line congruency angle to understand how much of the deformity is coming from the joint so uh, of course if you have a, a, a the program will tell you looking at the values that we get if the deformity is uh, in cases of the varus is on the femur or the tibia same for valgus 
or in case you have a double level deformity, it will also tell you that it, this is a double level deformity and we, sh we should be aiming for a double level osteotomy. So taking into account the joint line congruency angle, it's very important because it represents the laxity of the soft tissues, but also, and most importantly, the cartilage wear. If we don't take this into account, we might end up overcorrecting the deformity because some of the varus might come from cartilage wear or valgus, and it's very important to take that into account. So ideally, to do that, we should have comparative stress x-rays comparing sides, but the problem is that sometimes the other side is not healthy, and these stress x-rays are not always available. So we took this formula that is on the left, on the right screen, we, uh, we adapted it and we took into account the, the mathematical formula that Dr. Christian Clay also has spoken of. And we make it that, we incorporated that into the automatic osteotomy tool. So the next step is to select the degree of correction. With, uh, we know that with a neutral axis, there are already more forces going through the lateral compartment. And some surgeons defend that the degree of correction should be adapted to the indication. So if you have a song or an osteoarthritis grade two or one, maybe you don't need to go over 55%, for example. And if you have an osteoarthritis grade three or four, maybe you, we can go up to 60 or 62%. It seems there are some papers showing that there, are no, there is no benefit with larger corrections. So what we give here is you, we give you the, the decision on, on where do you want the new joint line um, weight bearing line to go through, okay? So in selecting the cut, we, we aim to correct the tibia on the medial side. So either if it's a valgus or a varus, we do it medially because you don't need uh, to do a fibular osteotomy, no risk of fibular nerve damage, no risk of controllable, uh, you have a controllable slope. It's a safer procedure and it's also faster. And on the, the femur side, we advocate for a closed wedge osteotomy, either on the medial side or the lateral side, because you know that the femur is not such a forgiving bone. If you are doing an open wedge um, DFO, when you end up with an inch fracture, like on this picture on the right side, you might be in trouble, very hard to control uh, the rotation and the opening as well. So we might end up in trouble. And uh, a closed wedge is, is more stable, has faster healing, and the leg length discrepancy might not be so significant to consider it a disadvantage. So then after that, you just do the cuts and you have the osteotomy. So now I'm, I'm gonna try to do a live planning here. So this is the JPEG image, but you can use Daikon as well. So you, you click and start, you start planning. We choose the knee. Then you need to calibrate. If you have a small sphere here, you can calibrate it automatically. But if not, you just have to do it manually, okay? We go here. 10 millimeters, 10 centimeters. So now it's here is the, the, the image is scanned. Now you do need to go to the procedures. And this patient, actually, I apologize, this patient is wearing pants, but this is, there's a story behind it. Uh, we got a new long leg x-ray on our hospital. I was feeling a little sore on my left knee. So I went there to check it out. And this ends up to, do, to be my, my, uh, my own x-ray. So we're going to plan my future left knee osteotomy. So you click on the left side, knee osteotomy. We start the planning. Now, we do these markings here. You can have, you have a magnifier here if you want to, to help you with the planning, with the marking. If you have any doubts, there's a question mark here that tells you what we want you to mark. Then we go to the distal femur. Tibial width. And then we go to the ankle. And we are done. Okay, so this is the result. You see, I have a, almost six degrees of varus. My weight bearing line is going through 22% of the tibial plateau. And it's clearly because of my tibia, which is in varus. So we go to this wheel here. We have here, we have summarized the, the, the values of our deformity, six degrees, almost six degrees. The femur is normal, the tibia is varus, and the joint line is okay. 
So the program tells you it's a tibial varus deformity, so we propose an HTO. So that's what we are going to do. We just mark the HTO here. And now we have this screen where you can take into consideration the joint line congruency angle, and you can choose where you want the new weight bearing line to go through. If you look on the, on the right, it's moving, and you can choose where you, you want the new Michalic line. So maybe let's go to 50%, so I don't get a very valgus knee. So you just do auto osteotomy, and the osteotomy is done. It's, it tells you here it's 7.7 .7 millimeters opening, you see the tibia is back to normal, the femur is the same, the weight bearing line is going to 50% and the, the mechanical tibial femoral angle is neutral. Okay, you can even add if you, you want a, a plate. You can put a thumbfix plate, for example. You put it here and there you go. You have your osteotomy plan really fast and the patient will be happy for sure. So now I, I want to show you a few more cases that the, the, live, the tool does. So this is a patient that was, I, I was asked for a colleague to plan. He is a 55 year old patient, previous medial meniscectomy. He has a varus as you can see. So the, the, my colleague said, okay, see if I can do, see if he's a good candidate for a IT velocity otomy. So that was exactly what I was trying to, to look into. So if you look at this, he has a 11 degrees of varus, but both the femur and the tibia are normal. So as you can see, this comes exclusively from cartilage wear. There's no extraarticular deformity. So what I told my colleague is that maybe this one, this is not the right candidate for a, an osteotomy. Maybe you should aim for a, a partial or total knee replacement because the values are normal. So maybe we need to recheck this. And uh, that's what exactly what he did. And he uh, ended up doing a partial knee replacement. So now I wanna show you the importance of the joint line congruency angle. You see it's a little bit high here. The normal is up to two. So this case is a case where we have uh, various deformity as well. So the mechanical tibial femoral axis is almost eight, uh, almost nine. The femur is normal, be almost in the limit of the normal. The MPTA is odd, so 80, 85, and the joint line congruency angle is 3.8. So as you can see, this is a tibial varus deformity, so the right procedure to do should be an HTO, a medial open wedge HTO. Now, once more, you get to choose where you want the weight bearing line to go through. Let's aim for 50%, for example. And now you have this, with a simple click, you take into account the joint line congruency angle. So you do the osteotomy. First, the program does an osteotomy on the joint line. So this is a small opening. So it brings the, the joint line to normal, almost normal. And then it, it does the open wedge uh, HTO. And now it, it gives you the millimeters that you need to open. And as you can see, if you look at it, the TV is at 92 degrees. So this is at the upper limit of the acceptable, 92 or 93 degrees. It's almost the limit that you can go to when you're doing these osteotomies. So, and now I'm going to show you what happens if you don't take into account the joint line congruency angle. If you just ignore it and do, or if you do it, for example, when you are doing manually, it's difficult to control the joint line. So, if you just ignore the joint line congruency angle and, and you aim for the same 50%, the result is, the, is that you end up with an opening of almost 12.5 millimeters. And if you look at the tibia, it's at almost 94 degrees, the tibia. So this is a little bit beyond the acceptable. What happens is that you end up with a big obliquity on the joint line and the, the, the survivorship of the osteotomy might be at risk. So with a simple click, you don't have to worry, you just click it and you take that into account. So I'm gonna show you some more complex cases. This is a double level osteotomy because as you can see, the patient has a varus uh, coming from both the tibia and the femur. So the program tells you it's a varus deformity. We propose a combined HTO and DFO. And you click next, 
you just do the markings of the HTO. You do the markings of the closed wedge lateral DFO. And then it's the same thing. You just select the degree of correction that you want to, to do, where you want the new weight bearing line to go through. And then you just click an auto osteotomy and it does the cuts. It says how many millimeters do you have to cut on the tibia, how many millimeters you have to clo close on the femur. So in this case, if you see, you would take seven millimeters from the femur and that same wedge would, could be used for the 6.4 millimeters on the tibia. So you see a complex deformity, really easy to perform, everything is such green, so you're doing the right thing. Okay, now I will be showing you uh, one more case. This is actually a patient of mine. She's 55 years old. She works in a cafe, she has a cafe. As you can see, it's a huge valgus. A lot of cartilage wear on the lateral side. So you see everything is at red, weight bearing line. You can't even see where it goes through here because it goes beyond the tibial plateau. So it's the same thing. It tells you it's a 16 degrees valgus, the valgus on the femur on the tibia. And with the, let me just show you here. It has a 6.6 .6 degrees of opening of the joint line congruency angle opening on the medial side. And since it's a valgus deformity, we propose a combined HTO and DFO. So we do the same thing. We mark the cuts as the, the software tells you on the left screen. And we just do, we select the, the joint line congruency angle so it can correct a little bit of it. It can't correct it all. You have a big uh, cartilage wear on the, on the lateral compartment. So after the, the, we do our selections, it tells you, it does the automatic correction. It tells you how many millimeters you have to take from the femur and how many millimeters you have to take from the tibia. So actually, when I did this osteotomy, I didn't take that into account, the joint line congruency angle, because this was previous to these new concepts that I've been, we've been uh, studying. So as you can see in the result, the patient has a varus knee, has a, has a, well, it's corrected, but it's a little bit and slight varus. This is because the tibia is a little bit varus and we end up not being able to put the, this screw, but since this is a closing biplanar, uh, closing wedge, it healed very, very good. So she, she's six months here with a good range of motion and very happy. So I want to now get back to when I went to my previous institution, my institution and, and analyzed all the osteotomy patients. When running that through, uh, through uh, uh, the tool, it shows that, that the osteotomy tool suggests a different procedure in 50% of cases. So this might be cases where the deformity was on both bones and you, we only corrected one, or in the case of there were no extraticular deformities and we did the osteotomy as well. So it's very, the key message is it's very important to plan the osteotomy and do the proper deformity analysis. So for future directions for me and PICMED, uh, we, uh, we welcome every feedback we can get from everyone that is using the program. We will try to introduce more osteotomies to the automatic planning because we are having some surgeons that still prefer to do lateral close wedge HTO for varus on the tibia and lateral open wedge DFO for valgus on the femur. And we will continue looking up at the latest evidence to keep this tool the most advanced possible. So I would like to thank you all for your attention and uh, I'm gladly, be gladly answer your questions now. Thank you. Um, uh, Levi or Levi? How do you pronounce your name? It's the same. You can use it both. It can be okay. Levi. Okay. Um, so that that was a nice uh, demonstration of you know everything that the software can do. I've got two or three um, questions. Number one, uh, when you showed us the scaling. Yes. 
uh, normally what we do is we put a uh, 30 mm sphere in the plane of the bone okay but what you did on this was you put it on that calibration which i think is on the plane so the magnification on the film plane is less than uh, what you would measure it off a sphere because the sphere is away from the film. Does that affect the um, accuracy? Well, you, you have to you're, find. You're the... talking about you know, millimeters. Yes, this this uh, software that the the new machine that we have it has, actually has a, an inbuilt calibration. So, and the ideal would be to have a marker close to the knee. And we have a sphere the, for that, or a, a coin. It's, it's not ideal because it's not spherical, but we can use a coin as well, and have it as close to the knee as possible. So, and in that case, you would be aiming for the the best correction or the best measurement calibration possible, of course. Because one of the problems, any machine which calibrates itself, you know, if you've got a thick thigh. Yeah, it's and true. if you've got a thin thigh, that's going to have a difference. And we are measuring, you know, six millimeters, seven millimeters. So having the leg, the bone that far away from the uh, X-ray plate yeah, true, true. will give you a magnification, even if you are have a machine which is automatically calibrate, calibrated. That's something we need something to solve here. It's a problem. So uh, you use this in how many cases now? Well, I've been planning uh, for a lot of colleagues of mine as well. So I, we've been using for more than 100 cases already. OK. So uh, what I wanted then was when you planned on the software, you yes. then also double check it with the alignment rod on table, right? Yeah, but uh, we we do that. Actually, there's a, a, a study that uh, you can also do it with the, with the string from the electrocautery. Yeah. But the thing is, it's I think it's more it, it, the our experience, and I've been talking with this for with a lot of colleagues, is that if you just stick to the plan, it's more accurate than what you do in the in the alignment with the alignment rod in the OR because if you move a little bit the ankle if you don't do enough pressure to in the ankle to simulate weight bearing if you move a little bit on the hip it it changes everything so we do it but what we found is that if we just ignore the and you do what exactly what you planned it's actually more accurate than you trying to to measure it on the table because it's really it's really dependent on your assistant as well. If you have the, the ankle and the knee in the right position, if the patella is facing forward. So it's, it's harder to, to, I don't think, this is something we are discussing as well, because in my opinion now, what I did is I forgot, for, uh, forget the rod and that's j just do what I planned. Right, so that's, that's very interesting because that leads to a follow-up question. Uh, you've done 100 uh, cases. Have you looked at, the post operative, the measurements with the same software, you know, that you planned for uh, 55, say 50. Yes, that, percent. that study is on, on How track. Much you that study is on track. But the thing is, uh, if, even if you plan it very well, it's always depending on the surgical technique. So, um, what we see is that uh, the, place, the patients that we aim for 50%, for example, you, you are doing it, if you're doing the, the last ones that we, we did, as I told you, where we forget the rod, we are actually getting good results. One, two, three percent of difference. So th there are some that I plan for colleagues of mine, and I don't have the, the feedback of, of the full result. But uh, if you ignore it and the, the range that we get, it's really close to what we plan. And this is a good thing because this shows us that when you, the joint line congruency angle that we are taking into account is working. So there are a lot of big deformities as well. And if, if we are, the, the joint line congruency angle correction is not something total, totally explained yet, but we are using this formula and it's working because the, the doing as we plan, 
we are not getting too far away. We never had more than 5% of uh, deviation, for example. So if you aim for 50, if you end up with 45 or 55, you can still consider that a good result. But if you have a certain amount of joint line um, opening up, yes. and in that patient, instead of 55, you go to 45, it's quite likely that the joint line may not open up because there is a point at which when the weight bearing axis, say let's talk about a virus, only when the joint, the, the weight bearing axis shifts a certain 50%. amount, only then it will tip over. I'm not so sure that it is always 50% because sometimes you get it 50% at the it joint. It depends on the cartilage wear that you have. I think it That's depends right. also on the cartilage wear that you have. You know that as you go, if you, are a, if you have a medial um, bear, uh, osteoarthritis, as you move to the lateral side, the cartilage wear on the medial side will, each time will be a lesser of a contribution to the, to the deformity. So in that case, we try, this is the best we can do to take that into account and shift the minimum amount that you, you can to control it. So this is something that we are learning too. And, and as we are doing more and more osteotomies, we are, we are taking that into account. And um, I have cases where I did, for example, for a, valgus uh, for a valgus knee, I did a tibial closing wedge osteotomy. I closed exactly what I planned, but even so, I couldn't shift the, the load totally for, to the medial side. So the cartilage wear was a little bit more than I assumed. And when I did the correction, if you miss five, one millimeter, for example, it might be enough to get it for, to not get it for 50%, for example. So that's something that we are, but, but if you don't do any analysis of the joint line, then it will be a total disaster for sure. No, no, of course. So my, my, my question was exactly that, that especially now that you have the uh, sort of a good tool to, to measure the joint line, you know, whatever you study out of this will be um, quite useful in the sense in how many cases did the joint, what kind of plan? Sorry, I'm missing you. I can't hear you. In talk is what they call the tipping point. And if I understand it right, in a lot of these lateral laxities, that tipping point is somewhere on the lateral tibial spine and not in the center, which means not 50, it's closer to 55, 60, when you have a large amount of lateral opening. That was what my understanding was. Especially if you've got, you know, a tibia vara, not only because of cartilage damage, also because of a primary tibia vara which we have a lot of in, in uh, yes. India, we have a lot of that kind of deformity. So the, the lateral, and then you want to ensure that it's going to close, then you want to go at least, uh, because what you are talking of is, I think zero degrees of uh, valgus, mechanical axis, perfectly straight, when you say 50%. Yes, but what, what I, uh, the, the thing is that the, the software allows you to do that correction. If you're, if you think that um, the tipping point is around 55%, for example, you just can, you can select I it. Uh, I, I designed it so you can uh, use Being your own ideas you and do the correction as you want. Of course, uh, there are some advocates of uh, larger corrections. It's okay. We don't have, uh, you just have the, the possibility to do the, the correction as you desire. Right, so I, I showed you all always fifty percent in the in the in the examples, but of course you can go further. I understand. So, uh, I, I if you have your, a lot of cases, uh, or if you have uh, in terms of sorry. Yeah, no, no I mean I, I, to look at your follow-up study in terms of how well we are because the point you made that, that you know it de there is certain things which come with your surgical technique also um, what i have realized is i have always tended to over uh, estimate the correction 
with other ways of planning. And therefore, I will generally tend to go maybe a couple of millimeters less and then uh, double check with the uh, rod. So I, what that basically means is I'm not sure where my mistake is coming in from. It's from surgical technique. Uh, but once you say you have your um, cases, more people are looking at this now, then we get the numbers and we can find out exactly how, how much we need to factor in the joint line convergence angle. I'm sure you need to factor it in. No question about that. So I think that's, that's a, a good uh, aspect of the software. Yeah. Uh, also, if you, it, it's not, 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 not something isolated. So if you're planning a correction and you see that the correction that it's giving you, it's turning the bone that you are correct, uh, the deformity in with a, a, a large uh, over deformity. So if you get a tibia of 93 or 94, maybe you should check it. Maybe we should check it out and see, okay, maybe this is not the, the correct procedure or I'm not doing something right here. Maybe the femur has also a deformity or not. And that's where the program uh, has helped you with, can help with, uh, to not uh, overlook some of the smaller deformities on both bones as well. Yes, that's we, true. With, with, with that study that we did, we learned a lot. So 50% of cases where we should do something else, it's a really big number. So we started to carefully plan our surgeries a little bit better. And we hope that we, that will bring uh, um, better results in the future as well. Certainly. Great. Vaibha? My friend Vaibha is you. an arthroplast. Vaibha, my friend, is an arthroplasty surgeon. Yes. So he has mute. His microphone is muted. No, no, I, I'm on now. He's on now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, so, so very impressive software. Yeah. Uh, impressed by the entire uh, planning and in the concept of GLCAs. Now, um, as uh, Dr. Mangal said, I'm primarily an arthroplasty surgeon. So my question would be relatively simple. Uh, so could you quantify where the virus is coming from in, with the help of the software? For example, there is a convergence angle which kind of give you a surrogate marker that it's the cartilage that is contributing to the deformity. So if you had a software which could tell us that look, 10% is contributed with because of the loss of cartilage. There is 50% coming from the metaphyseal remodeling, and maybe 40% which is extra ligamentous. Is that possible? Because that would change the way we think of the the virus as a large subset. Yes, but what what that's already what we are doing. We are don't know for sure, but we are attributing to some. We look at the formula that is on the osteotomy book where you can, what we do is, if you have stress x-rays with uh, the patient um, with a, right, a good knee and a bad knee, if you do a stress x-ray and you reduce the deformity, a virus deformity that, that the patient has, and you compare the, the, the difference in the millimeters of opening on the lateral side, for example, in the virus, from one side to the other, that, that those millimeters are the millimeters that come from the cartilage wear. So with that formula that it's on the book, if you take that, there's a constant number. If you take that and you divide it by the tibial plateau, you get the, the degree of virus that comes from the cartilage wear. Um, I can show you here, uh, uh, well, I can show you the formula again. And I will tell you exactly what we are, what, what I'm trying to, to show you. Yeah, but could you quantify it for each patient? Because normally the virus would be a combination of, of both of those, meaning a cartilage wear and some amount of metaphyseal remodeling and possibly also a constitutional virus. Yes, I think so, it's possible to, to, be, to, to get the, because the that actual me, contribution of each one. Because that would tell me in which patients I would be choosing an osteotomy vis-a-vis -vis in which patients it's primarily a cartilage issue and that I would, should be addressing cartilage at the joint level. I, I well, the, um, yes. yes, if you, take, if you think like this, if, you, if there's any deformity, ex, extra articular deformity on the bone, 
even if it's small. And if, if there is a large uh, contribution for the cartilage wear, you can still do an osteotomy. If you have a, a metaphysical deformity, you can still do it. But you must know that the results will not be so good because the, most, uh, the, the more arthritic the knee, the worse the results. And you can't co overcorrect the metaphysical uh, bone to a, to a point where you get a huge joint line obliquity. So osteotomy, it's, it's what you, you could call like a more palliative osteotomy where you have already a very, very important cartilage wear, but you still have some extraticular deformity. So exactly, so, that's the point. So would, would software tell us that, look, these are the guys whom, uh, whom, who should be referred to me versus yeah. who should be sent to Mangal? No, no, you can send all to me because I, I'll do joints also, not a problem. <laughs> oh, no, actually, it, same, oh, here. But, but, same here, same here. Know, but I do, I one, of, one of the points he made initially was that only that the software calculates your LDFA and your MPTA. Now, if your MPTA and your LDFA are both normal, 87 yes, degrees, then this is primarily a cartilage or a lateral laxity that also could be there. But now, hmm. whether it's lateral laxity. Uh, how much lateral laxity and how much cartilage you will have to decide by doing uh, stress x-rays of both the sides and uh, comparing no. that. So no. what cartilage is not gone is lateral laxity. No, I understood that part of it. What my point is, 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 is the question is, what do you define as joint? Is it just the joint line? Or is it what is something which is, when, when we call it an extra articular, it means an extra ligamentous deformity. That means that we must know what's the attachment of SMCL on the femoral side on, on the tibial side. Okay. So yeah, but, for um, me, extra articular deformity is one, which is more than seven centimeter away from the joint line on the tibial side and more than three centimeter away. Oh, you are, you are talking of whether I will be able to correct this deformity by a replacement or whether it needs an extra articular osteotomy that way. So three things. One, whether it's a pure joint issue. Number two, whether it's a metaphysical issue. And whether three, it's a primarily tibia vara. In which case, and, and, and as a surgeon, I might choose to do either of the three things. But would the software give me that information as a quantification? So example, someone would have some contribution coming from the joint line congruence angle to suggest that, okay, there is this degree of cartilage wear. There's this, this much of the metaphysical remodeling contributing to the virus. And probably this guy also had an extra articular constitutional virus, which you may have to leave when you are planning your correction, either as a joint or as an osteotomy. Yeah, not in this particular automatic software. It doesn't do it like that. But you, you have the deformity analysis and you can look at it as uh, you can look at individually at the joint line congruency angle, individually at the... Uh, the both values, but it doesn't give you the right percentage of, of each one. Exactly. So, so that is what I do manually. So when I plan any deformity, but you don't need to do it manually. You can, yeah, you so can so just mark so the points could, and yeah. So if you, your software could tell me that, look, these are the three components and you can choose what, what you want to correct. That would be really great rather than doing it manually for us. Of course, something we will look into. You also do this in uh, 3D or this is only in 2D? No, at the moment, the, since you're, when you are planning an osteotomy, you're looking at the, the long leg x-rays mainly. So yeah. we make it simple and we use the, the long leg x-rays. We do some manually plan. You can do everything you are. To, this does automatically. You can do it manually. So what I've been done, doing for some friends as well is I and colleagues, I've been doing some uh, another type of deformity corrections, for example, for tibial slope changes for uh, uh, patients who have uh, three ACL ruptures and re-ruptures and you end up finding that they have a really increased tibial slope. Uh, and I've done some uh, manual planning of that. On 3D, we, are, we, well, we could use them for uh, especially those blunt deformities it would be important to do a three-dimensional three correction as well. But since those cases are so rare, we can't do it automatically. So you can do it manually. You can look at the, the CT or the MRI manually, and you can make some cuts on them. But 
automatically to, to plan a double uh, uh, blonde deformity in several planes. It's not, uh, it's not well, but manually, manually you do use uh, 3D planning. Yes, for example, for trauma, you can, uh, if you get a uh, tibial plateau fracture, you can divide the fragments, separate them, see where they fit, fit in a plate, see where you're going, where, where the plate is, try to measure the size of the screws, if it's calibrated. There are some, there is room for that, of course. It's not, but it's impossible to do it automatically now. But uh, we don't say we won't be able to do it in, in the future as well. We don't know. <laughs> yeah. We are always evolving.